Welcome to Media with Magic, an audio cast discussing various pieces of media from pagan perspectives. I am Jackie, your host, and just in time for Beltane, I am bringing you Robin Hardy's 1972 film, The Wicker Man. To discuss this film and its themes at any length, one has to include spoilers, so if you've never seen the movie, I recommend looking for a copy before continuing this review. Amazon Instant, for example, has it available to rent and stream. Bear in mind that almost every version of this movie on the internet is a different cut. Most all of what I will reference will have to do with the shortest release, the U.S. one, which is the one that Amazon has, but I will try to specify when I am referencing either the book or a longer cut of the film. Spoilers from here onward. As a Wiccan, I've known several people who follow similar paths, who are uncomfortable with the subject matter of the film because the pagans are essentially the villains. Some have questioned the accuracy of the traditions portrayed, or even just have trouble going through the film with Neil Howey as the main protagonist, because he, prosely he proselytizes frequently and without invitation, to the point of seeming over the top, especially to a modern audience. These are all points I will address once my summary is complete. Our story here centers around a police officer in Scotland by name of Sergeant Neil Howey, who is called to a remote island community called Summer Isle, to investigate the disappearance of a little girl, Rowan Morrison. The townspeople seem friendly, but unhelpful, and very quickly how he realizes the island is, as he calls it, pagan. And in the days before May Day, a lot of them are bawdy and overtly sexual, and this is something that causes him no end of discomfort. An Episcopalian, and rigidly devout even by Episcopalian standards, he does not connect with their ways at all and much of his interactions with the townspeople in preparation for their coming celebrations are made up of him sputtering and ranting about how godless he thinks all of them are. This includes the head of the community, Lord Summerisle, played by Christopher Lee. At first, the people in the community insist that there is no girl named Rowan on the island, nor has there ever been. Even her mother, named in the letter, says as much. But little things, like seeing her name crossed out in the local school ledger, and her little sister telling Howie that Rowan is in actuality a March Hare, lead him to believe the townspeople are giving him the runaround. It finally comes out at the school that Rowan is dead, and the adults just simply don't talk about death, preferring to believe that people die and live on in the trees, water or animals, like a hare, for instance. So once she passed on, the community as a whole just referred to her as her newly born self. So Rowan doesn't exist anymore to them. However, Howie can't find a body or a death certificate, so this doesn't really hold up to him. As he learns more about their customs and researches ancient traditions on his own time, he also discovers that Summer Isle, famous for its apple es exports, are experiencing a shortage due to their crops failing. He begins to suspect that Rowan is still alive but is being held for an upcoming sacrifice. The townspeople seem intent on having him leave before May Day, and once he believes his, his suspicions are true, he intends to return with more police officers, only to, disco to discover his plane has been sabotaged, leaving him stranded there as the celebrations commence in earnest. As the procession begins, he disguises himself to blend in with the crowd in the hopes of seeing Rowan and making off with her before anyone can understand what is going on. This is successful, and while Rowan initially behaves as though her life is indeed in danger, she leads him to a cliffside off the sea where all of the townspeople are waiting to confront him. There, Lord Summerall explains that how he was lured there under false pretenses in order to be sacrificed himself. How he is overpowered and taken to a great wooden structure, the titular wicker man, already filled with sac sacrificial animals and completed when he is also locked inside. The townspeople light the, the structure ablaze, and while they sing happily, how he calls out to God and prays for his soul as he burns to death. The dismal, misogynist, brainless Neil LeBute remake of this film notwithstanding, the ending of this movie remains one of the most iconic twists of all time. And the way tension builds, especially in the final act, makes this movie one of the best horror films of its kind. So now to the issues. I, I want to remind everyone that in this regard, my opinions are my own and do not reflect everyone else's. So you are free to disagree with me and decide that this film is not in any way for you. First of the main issues is, does the movie villainize pagans? I would say not as a whole. First off, if you've heard the summer, you know already that this group of people conspired to kill a man as a ritual sacrifice to revitalize their crops. There's no getting around that this is evil, unless you really dislike preachy Christians enough so much that an innocent guy being burnt to death looks like an act of good, and I'll discuss how he's a character later. 
there are story driven reasons for where the island stands on on all this and this is why i say not as a whole this is clearly this specific community i would actually sooner argue that the people of summer isle's failing is more entrusting their leader to direct them christopher lee's lord summer isle explains to howie in private conversation how summer isle as a community came to be that first there were monasteries and a population of working poor who were trying and failing to eke out an existence in this barren place, but they were noticeably unhappy and unsuccessful. Summer Isle's ancestor, a Victorian scientist, cultivated several new breeds of plant that could survive in the cold weather there. At the same time, he also introduced old Celtic traditions to the townspeople. Seeing the crops thrive, the, the townspeople embraced this new religion and the churches and monasteries folded, their inhabitants fleeing never to return. While Summer Isle insists that he is devout and believes in the old ways, he makes no bones about the fact that his ancestor did not and saw the introduction of, the, uh, of this religion as a way to control the common masses. It worked. The crops are failing now, he says, because the strains are overbred and they obviously need to get a botanist in there to fix things. There's more to what Lord Summer Isle likely knows. Beltane, or May Day as they call it in here, is a festival of creation where the god and goddess join and, in essence, bring about the fruits of the harvest. Lamas, however, is the festival in which sacrifices are made. This is when the god dies in order to regenerate the crops and begins the cycle of rebirth anew. There are old European tales of a king or noble being sacrificed after a failed harvest, offering the best in order to receive the best, as Thea Sabin puts it. As she continues to say, while Gerald Gardner and some of his contemporaries received criticism for propagating these stories in their time, they remain part of the background radiation that is Lamas to this day, as stories, symbols alluded to. But for this inaccuracy that, that Summer Isle and his people are doing something that should have been reserved for Lamas and not May Day, um, you might argue was deliberate within the context of the story. This is what the people of Summer Isle are attempting to do. Sacrifice by way of cheating. Howie's time on their island is spent on their end, leading him on a merry chase and leading him to take or even avoid certain actions in order to make him a symbolically worthy sacrifice to their gods. They even make him a king of sorts, toying with the old fool as a king for a day motif that's present in a lot of old traditions and not just pagan ones. I say they are cheating here because as I described before, you are supposed to give up your best in this sort of sacrifice. These people, led by Lord Summer Isle, didn't even give their weakest. They refused flat out to commit a real sacrifice, all while mocking Neil Howie for not truly understanding the meaning of sacrifice himself, something he proves time and again that he actually does understand. He's even the one who wisely points out, not even knowing about Lamas, that if this doesn't work, by their logic, they have to kill Lord Summer Isle next. Lord Summer Isle, who very obviously knows exactly why the crops failed and how they can be fixed without killing anyone. Lord Summer Isle, who is not about to offer up his own life for common people. So are the pagans the villains of this movie? Absolutely. Any group led by a corrupt leader whom all the people trust without question can be villainous. In your own viewing, consider perhaps the dynamics of a coven that may be run by someone who is manipulative or controlling. Abusive. Look at the movie again. Can you see similar traits that might play out there? What are the social dynamics of the characters present on the island? I understand the initial conflict in, in looking at what counts for representation in a, movie, in, in a movie and the need to move away from constant negative depictions. If you don't want to be party to that, that's your decision and a respectable one. I personally think that the movie is enjoyable, still, if a bit cheesy, in spite of all of this. And it's really interesting to look at this film and see how much they got right and how they chose to interpret certain elements. We've already talked a little about accuracy in describing Lamas and Beltane specifically, but there's more to it than that. I remember seeing this movie for the first time in college and wondering about the specific deities the people of Summer Isle name in the movie and frowning at how little information I could find for them at the time. Nuada is one of the, is one of the names they use, for instance. I read this as, a, as inaccuracy and maybe a sign of them just making things up and using whatever names they wanted, or Lord Summer Isle's ancestor anyway. I came to find in later research, though, that communities in the British Isles back in, back in the day were extremely diverse, and while you might see multiple communities that have gods and goddesses of crops, of water, of household and family, etc., there would be a variance of names for all these deities. Traditions might be similar or differ in various ways, 
there was no established universal interpretation of these religious practices for the whole of, of the region, not in the same way that you might see in the Church of England, for instance. As far as one can tell, and the resources on this are limited, there was no Book of Common Prayer, no Nicene Creed that bound all of these small communities together. For this reason, you don't hear the people of Summerau throwing around what are probably more, university, more universally familiar names to Wiccans on a global scale. Summerau's ancestor was smart about that. There's also an element of this, along with the whole concept of pagan villains that comes from the book's source material, a novel by David Pinner called Ritual, which is similarly about a policeman going to an insular community and investigating the murder of a little girl. While it is tempting to say that that is literally where all the similarities end between this book and the movie, I have yet to finish it, but I have enough of an idea of its tone and tenor and its influences to understand what it was going for. You'll hear many people in the UK say that in the smaller communities, the old traditions continue to thrive. This is incorporated into the story as a horror or suspense element that is unique to the places where these stories happen. Small towns in their secret ways as something that's foreign, even unsafe in feeling to a common reader. This theme carries into The Wicker Man as well and is clearly one of its strongest influences. The strongest way in which the two pieces differ, in my opinion, is that the policeman in Penner's novel is much easier to like than Sergeant Howie. This brings us to the discussion of whether or not Howie is a detriment to the film and its enjoyability. Some people don't feel comfortable when others preach around them, and this seems like all Howie does at times in the film. Now, in longer cuts and the novel, you get a stronger insight to who he is as a character, and the edges are softened a little when he's better humanized. He's an avid bird watcher and a passionate conservationist, for instance. In fact, before dying in the novel, his last act is to free the birds trapped in the arms of the Wicker Man statue, because he's determined that as a policeman, he will at least save some lives. It will mean that his journey there was not a waste in his mind. He is engaged to be married, and he and his wife are actually going to be married once he returns from this investigation, were it not for unfortunate circumstances. With this missing from most cuts of the movie, seeing him flail to avoid temptation just makes him look more rigid and prudish. You never know he won't go to Willow McGregor's room because he's saving himself for the woman he loves. There are other little bits in the story here and there where he is actually quite reasonable and has good humor about what he's witnessing, and almost all of these are conspicuously absent from the final product. What you're left with is a performance that seems a bit much. That in itself can be enjoyable, even funny if you don't know where it's all heading. It's understandable, especially if you're bothered by over proselytizing, that you might not be able to enjoy the film still because of that. There's lots to take in while you write along, though. Even moments where Edward Woodward's performance produces some great laughs, especially in the banter between him and Lord Summerisle. Overall, I think this is a piece of film that's not to be missed. The story is engaging, the visuals gripping, and the music beautiful. That's actually one aspect of the film I didn't talk about much, so I'll do it here, because this movie technically counts as a musical. Almost every scene is punctuated by a song of some sort, often devotional music pertaining to whatever ritual is taking place. Take a look at the soundtrack on YouTube if you're ever interested. In particular, the Maypole song is a good example of ritual music used, as well as the Fire Leap. Most of the songs are body or sexual in nature, to the point that you don't know, if you don't know much about Beltane, you'd wonder if these people were so oversexed all the time, or if it was just a holiday thing. Spoiler, it's totally a holiday thing. My favorite piece in the soundtrack is, in the soundtrack is only present in longer cuts of the movie, taking place during a ritual scene where a teenager coming of age goes to bed with Willow McGregor as a symbolic representation of the god and goddess meeting and joining, which kicks off the beginnings of their May Day celebrations. The song is called Gently Johnny and is sung by a group of people in the pub below Willow's room and Sergeant Howie's. The scene includes a monologue by Lord Summerisle about the freedom that animals know, and not feeling guilt for answering their urges or worrying that God will judge them for them. It's an eerie and moody moment that's sorely missed in the U.S. cut, because it establishes Lord Summerisle as the puppet master in all these goings-on, even before Howie gets to fully meet him. The movie's really only for older teens and adults, but it's a must if you're a horror fan, pagan or not. The Wicker Man has a long and storied history around so many, uh, why there are so many different cuts that exist, and it's all really fascinating to look into. If you've already seen the movie, I highly recommend the, the book uh, written by Anthony Schaefer, which is the closest you're ever going to get to seeing everything that was lost on the cutting room floor. Did you find this program informative? 
Are there any titles you would like me to consider examining in future posts? Leave your thoughts and ideas in the comments. Thank you for joining me. This has been Media with Magic.